Blog Talk Radio. Radio, and tonight we're talking about the four blood moons, Damascus, and Israel. We have a few guests tonight. We have Tim Williams, an ordained minister through the United Christian Fellowship Church in Porterville. We have John Capito, a uh, Bible scholar, and we also have Jim Plummer, and um, talking about the four blood moons. And now the four blood moons um, is called a tetrad, if you don't know what the significance of a tetrad of blood moons is, uh, the significance is that it happens very rarely. And when it does happen, um, there is something that happens with Israel. For example, the last two tetrads of blood red moons involved in 1948, the first one, or the the second to the most recent one, uh, there was uh, Israel became a nation again uh, after 2,000 years of being scattered throughout the uh, earth as the wandering Jew, the Jews finally had their own nation back, and that was very significant. And then in 1967, there was another set of uh, four blood red moons, a tetrad, and that was the Six-Day War, which if you know anything about that, that was where um, Israel was attacked by all of these Muslim nations. And so everybody expected Israel to get wiped off the face of the earth, but God stepped in, did some miraculous things, and in six days the Israelites won the war um, uh, decidedly. It was like no question. Uh, Amazing. You should watch that video if you go on YouTube and type in the Six-Day War. You should watch that if you haven't. Anyway, um, so the the Tetrad of Four Blood Red Moons, the first one was April 15th, and that was on Passover. Uh, That's another interesting thing about these four blood red moons. Um, They all land on Jewish feast days, either Passover or Sukkot, which is also known as the Feast of Tabernacles. And um, so the first one was April 15th, 2014. Oh, yeah, and a blood red moon, if you don't happen to know what a blood red moon is, that's a total lunar eclipse. And the, the moon turns blood red, as a result of the sun's rays uh, streaming through the um, atmosphere of the earth and wrapping around the earth and getting cast onto the moon, um, causing the moon to appear blood red. Um, So the first one was April 15, 2014. The next one's going to be October 8, 2014. Another interesting thing about this quadrat or this tetrad of blood red moons is that in between the sets of two blood red moons, On March 20th, 2015, there is a total solar eclipse, and that happens to land on 1 Nisan, which is the uh, first day of the first month of the Assyrian calendar. And uh, that day is thought to be the marking of the uh, creation of the universe by some um, Hebrew scholars. It was supposedly in 3761 B.C., that the universe was created on 1 Nisan. 1 Nisan was also uh, the date that uh, both or all three, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, were born and died uh, in the month of Nisan. Okay, so the next two blood red moons then after that uh, full solar eclipse are on April 4th, 2015, which is another Passover blood red moon. And then September 28th, 2015, which is another Sakat or Feast of Tabernacles, Blood Red Moon. So you got a Passover Blood Red Moon on April 15th, 2014. Already happened October 8th, 2014, another uh, Blood Red Moon on the Feast of Tabernacles or Sakat. Then we have the Solar Eclipse on March 20th, 2015. April 4th, 2015, Passover Blood Red Moon. And again, 
September 28th, 2015, a Sakat or a Feast of Tabernacles, Blood Red Moon. So uh, what do you guys think think about this? Uh, let's start with you, Tim. Well, um, you know, I, I, as you were going through all the information there, I was thinking about the night of the Blood Moon. Uh, uh, I was out in the street, and a lot of my neighbors were out, and uh, uh, they were obviously not Christians. They were just looking, you know, at, they've heard the term, Blood Moon. Most of them, as I was talking to them, you know, they've heard of lunar eclipses, uh, you know, most of their life, but they never heard of it in turn of a Blood Moon. So they're out there uh, all looking for this big spectacular thing. And where I was, it was a little bit uh, cloudy. So it was red. And, and as you mentioned, it's basically red. Uh, in the same manner that the sunset is red. The sun comes at an angle through the atmosphere and all the dust and everything uh, causes that red glow. Uh, But I heard several comments of, well, I heard about this thing. That was nothing. And uh, it gave me a chance to talk to him. It's not for, you know... You've heard me use this term a lot on here. People like to be titillated and thrilled. I mean, that's the reason we have horror movies and and uh, uh, thrill ride parks, amusement parks, and roller coasters and things. And uh, it was incredible the blank stares I got when I explained the significance isn't appearance of it, it's the timing And as you said, it lines up with these feasts, and it just proves uh, one more of the proofs that that God, from the beginning, the Creator, lined all this information and all these events up to uh, sort of punctuate his timeline and his prophecies and the things he has lined up for us to experience for real, not just to be thrilled by something red in the sky was incredible the the blank stares i received back but yeah. the significance yep. of them is like i said it's it's to prove you know we uh we did a show oh some time ago and <laughs> i i think you were kind of surprised because i argued with you a little bit over the shroud of turan and basically i you know i said hey it might be real i don't know i don't care i don't need it to make me a believer and i don't need a blood moon to make me a believer but to deepen my knowledge and intimacy with God to show that he set these things up, as he said in Genesis, as a sign to show his hand working. That's when we look up and we see the hand and the mind of God at work on our behalf if we're working with him. The Bible does say to look up the stars and the moon because they will be for signs and for seasons. It doesn't say right. anything about looking at the Shroud of Turin for a sign or anything right. like that. So I'm on the same page with you about that Shroud of Turin thing. But another interesting event that happened during the Tetrad of four blood red moons was in 1492. Uh, Spain actually expelled all of the Jews out of Spain. And at the same time, Columbus discovered America. And then America turned out to be the the safe haven for all the Jewish people. Interesting point on that, that as they were casting the Jews out, they were confiscating their properties and monies, and that money that they confiscated from them was the money that financed the finding of their eventual uh, haven in America. Oh, how ironic. I had no idea. That was the same pattern. There's God's hand at work again. It, It seems like something bad's happening, but he's using that resource to set up an escape and, and a haven. And, and you know, people are wanting to be thrilled, like I said earlier, about this big red thing in the sky, and that's not the point. It's God saying, see, watch me work. Be close to me. You know, enjoy what I'm doing and be comforted. Uh, I heard Columbus himself was actually a Jew that was pretending he wasn't a Jew. Like, he was right. a Jew, but he, he, he actually kind of, uh, pretended he wasn't a Jew so he could get the job driving the whatever the Mayflower or San Maria or whatever boat that was. Anyway, um, another thing I wanted to say was uh, 
for people who don't know where in the Bible it talks about a blood red moon and a solar eclipse, I found three different places. I think probably the most striking places in Revelation, because everybody knows that's the book of prophecy. And Revelation 6:12, it said, it says uh, in the King James Version, And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and then the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. Now, that's Revelation 6:12. And then again in Joel 2.31, King James says, The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. And then again in Acts 2.20, King James again says, The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and notable day of the Lord comes. Now that's three places in the Bible where it talks about the blood red moon and the the sun darkening and the moon turns to blood. And I know I've heard before when the Bible repeats something, then that's like extra significant. And so this event is repeated three times. To my knowledge, it may be more. I don't know. Do you know of any other places that's in there? Yeah, it's referred to in a few other places, but those are probably the three most significant. What do you know about... uh, Israel and its enemies. Now, I know that Israel is sur- surrounded by enemies. I'm just right. not sure, like, which ones are Israel's enemies. And it seems to me it might be easier to count which ones are not Israel's enemies. You know? Right. right now, very few. I mean, they're not even... Uh, they issued a statement the other day that uh, their only true ally is Canada. And that was maybe four days ago. They publicly said that. They said the only only country that they're really looking to for support and trust is Canada. It seems to me like something's going to happen with Israel regardless of these blood red moons. You know, the, the way things are heating up over there, over there with uh, Russia supporting Iran and its nuclear program. Um, it's like, well, why would Iran need a nuclear power plant? for energy when they've got all the oil in the world. I feel deeply honored and privileged to stand here before you today representing the citizens of the State of Israel. We are an ancient people. We date back nearly 4,000 years to Abraham Isaac and Jacob. We have journeyed through time. We've overcome the greatest of adversities. And we reestablished our sovereign state in our ancestral homeland, the land of Israel. Now, the Jewish people's odyssey through time has taught us two things. Never give up hope. Always remain vigilant. Hope charts the future. Vigilance protects it. Today, our hope for the future is challenged by a nuclear-armed Iran that seeks our destruction. But I want you to know That wasn't always the case. Some 2,500 years ago, the great Persian King Cyrus ended the Babylonian exile of the Jewish people. He issued a famous edict in which he proclaimed the right of the Jews to return to the land of Israel and rebuild the Jewish temple in Jerusalem. That's a Persian decree. And thus began an historic friendship between the Jews and the Persians that lasted until modern times. But in 1979, a radical regime in Tehran tried to stamp out that friendship. As it was busy 
crushing the Iranian people's hope for democracy. It also led wild chants of death to the Jews. Now, since that time, presidents of Iran have come and gone. Some presidents were considered moderates, others hardliners. But they've all served that same unforgiving creed, that same unforgiving regime. That creed that is espoused and enforced by the real power in Iran, the dictator known as the supreme leader, first Ayatollah Khomeini, and now Ayatollah Khamenei. President Rouhani, like the presidents who came before him, is a loyal servant of the regime. He was one of only six candidates the regime permitted to run for office. See, nearly 700 other candidates were rejected. So what made him acceptable? Well, Bukhani headed Iran's Supreme National Security Council from 1989 through 2003. During that time, Iran's henchmen gunned down opposition leaders in a Berlin restaurant. They murdered 85 people at the Jewish Community Center in Buenos Aires. They killed 19 American soldiers by blowing up the Kobar Towers in Saudi Arabia. Are we to believe that Wuhani the national security advisor of Iran at the time knew nothing about these attacks? Of course he did. Just as 30 years ago, Iran's security chiefs knew about the bombings in Beirut that killed 241 American Marines and 58 French paratroopers. Wuhani was also Iran's chief nuclear negotiator between 2003 and 2005. He masterminded the, the strategy which enabled Iran to advance its nuclear weapons program behind a smokescreen of diplomatic engagement and very soothing rhetoric. Now I know, Bukhani doesn't sound like Ahmadinejad. But when it comes to Iran's nuclear weapons program, the only difference between them is this. Ahmadinejad was a wolf in wolf's clothing. Wuhani is a wolf in sheep's clothing. A wolf who thinks he can pull the eyes, the wool over the eyes of the international community. Well, like everyone else, I wish we could believe Wuhani's words, but we must focus on Iran's actions. And it's the brazen contrast, this extraordinary contradiction between Wuhani's words and Iran's actions that is so startling. Wuhani stood at this very podium last week and praised Iranian democracy. Iranian democracy, he said. But the regime that he represents executes political dissidents by the hundreds and jails them by the thousands. Wuhani spoke of, quote, the human tragedy in Syria. Yet Iran directly participates in Assad's murder and massacre of tens of thousands of innocent men, women, and children in Syria. And that regime is propping up a Syrian regime that just used chemical weapons against its own people. Wuhani condemned the, quote, violent scourge of terrorism. Yet in the last three years alone, Iran has ordered, planned, or perpetrated terrorist attacks in 25 cities in five continents. Wuhani denounces, quote, attempts to change the re regional balance through proxies. 
Yet Iran is actively destabilizing Lebanon, Yemen, Bahrain, and many other Middle Eastern countries. Wuhani promises, quote, constructive engagement with other countries. Yet two years ago, Iranian agents tried to assassinate Saudi Arabia's ambassador in Washington, D.C. And just three weeks ago, an Iranian agent was arrested trying to collect information for possible attacks against the American embassy in Tel Aviv. Some constructive engagement. I wish I could be moved by Rouhani's invitation to join his wave, a world against violence and extremism. Yet the only waves Iran has generated in the last 30 years are waves of violence and terrorism that it has unleashed in the region and across the world. Ladies and gentlemen, I wish I could believe Wuhani, but I don't. Because facts are stubborn things. And the facts are that Iran's savage record flatly contradicts Wuhani's soothing rhetoric. Last Friday, Wuhani assured us that in pursuit of its nuclear program, Iran, this is a quote, Iran has never chosen deceit and secrecy. Never chosen deceit and secrecy. Well, in 2002, Iran was caught, red-handed, secretly building an underground centrifuge facility in Natanz. And then, in 2009, Iran was again caught red-handed, secretly building a huge underground nuclear facility for uranium enrichment in a mountain near Qom. Wuhani tells us uh, not to worry. He assures us that all of this is not intended for nuclear weapons. Any of you believe that? If you believe that, Here's a few questions you might want to ask. Why would a country that claims to only want peaceful nuclear energy, why would such a country build hidden underground enrichment facilities? Why would a country with vast natural energy reserves invest billions in developing nuclear energy? Why would a country intent on merely civilian nuclear programs continue to defy multiple Security Council resolutions and incur the tremendous cost of crippling sanctions on its economy? And why would a country with a peaceful nuclear program develop intercontinental ballistic missiles whose sole purpose is to deliver nuclear warheads. You don't build ICBMs to carry TNT thousands of miles away. You build them for one purpose, to carry nuclear warheads. And Iran is building now ICBMs that the United States says could reach this city in three or four years. Why would they do all this? The answer is simple. Iran is not building a peaceful nuclear program. Iran is developing nuclear weapons. Last year alone, Iran enriched three tons of uranium to three and a half percent, doubled its stockpile of 20 percent enriched uranium, and added thousands of new centrifuges, including advanced centrifuges. It also continued work on the heavy water reactor in Iraq. That's in order to have another route to the bomb, a plutonium path. And since Rouhani's election, and I stress this, this vast and feverish effort 
has continued unabated. Ladies and gentlemen, underground nuclear facilities, heavy water reactors, advanced centrifuges, ICBMs. See, it's not that it's hard to find evidence that Iran has a nuclear program, a nuclear weapons program. It's hard to find evidence that Iran doesn't have a nuclear weapons program. Last year when I uh, spoke here at the UN, I drew a red line. Now Iran has been very careful not to cross that line. But Iran is positioning itself to race across that line in the future at a time of its choosing. Iran wants to be in a position to rush forward to build nuclear bombs before the international community can detect it and much less prevent it. Yet Iran faces one big problem. And that problem can be summed up in one word, sanctions. I've argued for many years, including on this podium, that the only way to peacefully prevent Iran from developing nuclear weapons is to combine tough sanctions with a credible military threat. And that policy today is bearing fruit. Thanks to the efforts of many countries, many represented here, and under the leadership of the United States, tough sanctions have taken a big bite off the Iranian economy. Oil revenues have fallen, the currency has plummeted, banks are hard pressed to transfer money. So as a result, the regime is under intense pressure from the Iranian people to get the sanctions relieved or removed. That's why Rouhani got elected in the first place. That's why he launched his charm offensive. He definitely wants to get the sanctions lifted. I guarantee you that. But he doesn't want to give up Iranians nuclear, Iran's nuclear weapons program in return. Now here's a strategy to achieve this. First, smile a lot. Smiling never hurts. Second, pay lip service to peace, democracy, and tolerance. Third, offer meaningless concessions in exchange for lifting sanctions. And fourth, and the most important, ensure that Iran retains sufficient nuclear material and sufficient nuclear infrastructure to race to the bomb at a time that it chooses to do so. You know why Rouhani thinks he can get away with this? I mean, this is a ruse. It's a ploy. Why does Rouhani think he can, thinks he can get away with it? Because, because he's gotten away with it before. Because his strategy of talking a lot and doing little has worked for him in the past. He even brags about this. Here's what he said in his 2011 book about his time as Iran's chief nuclear negotiator. And I quote, while we were talking to the Europeans in Tehran, we were installing equipment in Isfahan. Now, for those of you who don't know, the Isfahan facility is an indispensable part of Iran's nuclear weapons program. That's where uranium ore called the yellow cake is converted into an enrichable form. Rouhani boasted, and I quote, by creating a calm environment, a calm environment, we were able to complete the work in Isfahan. He fooled the world once, now he thinks he can fool it again. You see, Wuhani thinks he can have his yellow cake and eat it too. And he has another reason to believe that he can get away with this. 
and that reason is called North Korea. Like Iran, North Korea also said its nuclear program was for peaceful purposes. Like Iran, North Korea also offered meaningless concessions and empty promises in return for sanctions relief. In 2005, North Korea agreed to a deal that was celebrated the world over by many well-meaning people. Here's what the New York Times editorial had to say about it. Quote, For years now, foreign policy insiders have pointed to North Korea as the ultimate nightmare, a closed, hostile, and paranoid dictatorship with an aggressive nuclear weapons program. Very few could envision a successful outcome. And yet North Korea agreed in principle this week to dismantle its nuclear weapons program, return to the NPT, abide by the treaty's safeguards, and admit international inspectors. And finally, diplomacy, it seems, does work after all. Ladies and gentlemen, a year later, North Korea exploded its first nuclear weapons device. Yet, as dangerous as a nuclear arm North Korea is, it pales in comparison to the danger of a nuclear-armed Iran. A nuclear-armed Iran would have a chokehold on the world's main energy supplies. It would trigger nuclear proliferation throughout the Middle East, turning the most unstable part of the planet into a nuclear tinderbox. And for the first time in history, it would make the specter of nuclear terrorism a clear and present danger. A nuclear-armed Iran in the Middle East wouldn't be another North Korea. It would be another 50 North Koreas. Now, I know that some in the international community think I'm exaggerating this threat. Sure, they know that Iran's regime leads uh, these chants, death to America, death to Israel, that it pledges to uh, wipe Israel off the map. But they think that this wild rhetoric is just bluster for domestic consumption. Have these people learned nothing from history? The last century has taught us that when a radical regime with global ambitions gets awesome power, sooner or later, its appetite for aggression knows no bounds. That's the central lesson of the 20th century. And we cannot forget it. The world may have forgotten this lesson. The Jewish people have not. Iran's fanaticism is not bluster. It's real. This fanatic regime must never be allowed to arm itself with nuclear weapons. I know that the world is weary of war. We in Israel, we know all too well the cost of war. But history has taught us that to prevent war tomorrow, we must be firm today. And this raises the question. Can diplomacy stop this threat? Well, the only diplomatic solution that would work is one that fully dismantles Iran's nuclear weapons program and prevents it from having one in the future. President Obama rightly said that Iran's conciliatory words must be matched by transparent, verifiable, and meaningful action. And to be meaningful, a diplomatic solution would require Iran to do four things. First, cease all uranium enrichment. This is called for by several Security Council resolutions. Second, remove from Iran's territory the stockpiles of enriched uranium. Third, dismantle the infrastructure for a nuclear breakout capability, 
including the underground facility at Qom and the advanced centrifuges in Natanz. And four, stop all work at the heavy water reactor in Iraq aimed at the production of plutonium. These steps would put an end to Iran's nuclear weapons program and eliminate its breakout capability. There are those who would readily agree to leave Iran with a residual capability to enrich uranium. I advise them to play close attention to what Rouhani said in a speech to Iran's Supreme Cultural Revolution, Supreme Cultural Revolutionary Council. This was published in 2005. I quote, here's what he said. A country that could enrich uranium to about 3.5% will also have the capability to enrich it to about 90%. Having fuel cycle capability virtually means that a country that possesses this capability is able to produce nuclear weapons. Precisely. This is why Iran's nuclear weapons program must be fully and verifiably dismantled. And this is why the pressure on Iran must continue. So here's what the international community must do. First, keep up the sanctions. If Iran advances its nuclear weapons program during negotiations, strengthen the sanctions. Second, don't agree to a partial deal. A partial deal would lift international sanctions that have taken years to put in place in exchange for cosmetic concessions that will take only weeks for Iran to reverse. Third, lift the sanctions only when Iran fully dismantles its nuclear weapons program. My friends, the international community has Iran on the ropes. If you want to knock out Iran's nuclear weapons program peacefully, don't let up the pressure. Keep it up. We all want to give diplomacy with Iran a chance to succeed. But when it comes to Iran, the greater the pressure, the greater the chance. Three decades ago, President Ronald Reagan famously advised, trust but verify. When it comes to Iran's nuclear weapons program, here's my advice. Distrust, dismantle, and verify. Ladies and gentlemen, Israel will never acquiesce to nuclear arms in the hands of a rogue regime that repeatedly promises to wipe us off the map. Against such a threat, Israel will have no choice but to defend itself. I want there to be no confusion on this point. Israel will not allow Iran to get nuclear weapons. If Israel is forced to stand alone, Israel will stand alone. Yet in standing alone, Israel will know that we will be defending many, many others. The dangers of a nuclear-armed Iran and the emergence of other threats in our region have led many of our Arab neighbors to recognize, finally recognize, that Israel is not their enemy. And this affords us the opportunity to overcome historic animosities and build new relationships, new friendships, new hopes. Israel welcomes engagement with the wider Arab world. We hope that our common interests and common challenges will help us forge a more peaceful future. And Israel con continues to seek an historic compromise with our Palestinian neighbors one that ends our conflict once and for all. We want peace based on security and mutual recognition in which a demilitarized Palestinian state recognizes the Jewish state of Israel. 
I remain committed to achieving an historic reconciliation and building a better future for Israelis and Palestinians alike. Now, I have no illusions about how difficult this will be to achieve. Twenty years ago, the peace process between Israel and the Palestinians began. Six Israeli prime ministers, myself included, have not succeeded in achieving peace with the Palestinians. My predecessors were prepared to make painful concessions. So am I. But so far, Palestinian leaders haven't been prepared to offer the painful concessions they must make in order to end the conflict. For peace to be achieved, the Palestinians must finally recognize the Jewish state. And Israel's security needs must be met. I am prepared to make an historic compromise for genuine and enduring peace. But I will never compromise on the security of my people and of my country, the one and only Jewish state. Ladies and gentlemen, one cold day in the late 19th century, my grandfather, Nathan, and his younger brother, Judah, were standing in a railway station in the heart of Europe. They were seen by a group of anti-Semitic hoodlums who ran towards them, waving clubs, screaming, death to the Jews. My grandfather shouted to his younger brother to flee and save himself. And he then stood alone against the raging mob to slow it down. They beat him senseless. They left him for dead. And before he passed out, covered in his own blood, he said to himself, what a disgrace, what a disgrace. The descendants of the Maccabees lie in the mud, powerless to defend themselves. He promised himself then that if he lived, he would take his family to the Jewish homeland and help build a future for the Jewish people. I stand here today as Israel's prime minister because my grandfather kept that promise. And so many other Israelis have a similar story, a parent or a grandparent who fled every conceivable oppression and came to Israel to start a new life in our ancient homeland. Together we've transformed a bludgeoned Jewish people, left for dead, into a vibrant, thriving nation defending itself with the courage of modern Maccabees, developing limitless possibilities for the future. In our time, the biblical prophecies are being realized. As the prophet Amos said, they shall rebuild ruined cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink their wine. They shall till gardens and eat their fruit, and I will plant them upon their soil, never to be uprooted again. Veshavti etshvut ami Yisrael, uvanu arim neshamot vayashavu, venatu kramim veshatu et yinam, veasu ginot veachlu et piriam, unetatim al admatam. Ladies and gentlemen, the people of Israel have come home never to be uprooted again. Well, I know why they say it, and this is crazy. I mean, I, I was watching... Uh, 
uh, a fellow the other day that was showing newspaper clippings, quotes of Iranian, of uh, the head mullah and Akhmenejab and, and a couple other government officials. And they have said over the last four years, numerous times, uh, that their goal is to wipe Israel off the face of the earth, that they're vermin and they need to be exterminated. But we seem to ignore that. Yeah, so anyway, uh, who are the enemies of Israel? We've got Egypt, which, to my knowledge, Egypt was friendly with Israel. And then recently, it kind of got overtaken by the Muslim Brotherhood. And there was some talk that the Obama administration actually flowed some money to the Muslim Brotherhood in that um, situation. And now they're over there beheading Christians in Egypt. They called the Arab Spring. They they flooded a bunch of money in there saying they were going to help change the government, and all they did was change it to the uh, Muslim Brotherhood. Right. Yeah, and wasn't it something ridiculous, like a billion dollars or something? I don't remember the figure. I know, you know, it's always a lot of money. Yeah, so Egypt apparently was uh, friendly with uh, Israel, and then since this thing with the Muslim Brotherhood coming in, and ironically, you know, it looks to me like we uh, instigated that, or at least we helped it along. Um, And I know in the Bible it says that anybody who goes against Israel, God will go against them, right? Yeah. Yeah, but I think that was a different Israel. In, in what way? In what way? Yeah. Right now, we're asking the question, who is Israel's enemy? Right now, I'm coming to the conclusion that Israel is its own worst enemy. You know, that's an interesting statement. Uh, I heard a guy say the other day, you know, back when they, the Six-Day War, in fact, the Six-Day War happened over in, in a tetrad. That's one of the significance of, of that tetrad, Four Blood Moon. And... Uh, they they took back Jerusalem and then were pressured to give back Gaza. That's where all the enemies are camped out now. They gave them back to the Palestinians, and that's where they, they shoot at them from, all the rockets. But the people that were the biggest, I just learned this about two weeks ago, the biggest pressure were the non-practicing or spiritual Jews. In other words, they're, they're, they're saying we're... We're Israelites, but we don't care about this crazy religious Judaism. And they were the biggest element, according to this one report, that said, oh, just give them what they want. Shut them up, and, uh, you know, we'll be okay. So I have to agree with you. That's a good point. I get the impression the state of Israel now has, as a community, has lost its faith. Uh, I don't see where they are. God's chosen people. I'm beginning to believe that a lot of them don't believe in God. Yeah, the, the, when, and that's always been their problem, hasn't it? And that's why they've always fallen, because they, they, uh, like he says, you, you know, you, you've forgotten who I am. You, you know, you, you, yeah. you don't look to me anymore. You've lost relationship, and uh, I have to do something about it. But you also oh. dissolve your family relationships because you do not have the appropriate discipline or an expression of a way to express love is through appropriate discipline. In other words, God's way rather than just man's way. And so I would imagine they're going to be soon come apart. Now, I want to connect this for a moment to the United States of America right now. Uh, I'm seeing and hearing that one of the greatest forces that support what I would call the modern baby boomer culture now in America has been a community of people who call themselves Jewish, but of whom the actual Jewish people, such as the Orthodox Church, Mm -hmm. do not even consider them Jewish. And another aspect in there I'm also finding, I've attended recently, uh, I guess you'd say a synagogue, that's not too far, far from my home, and I'm finding that I don't believe they believe in God. It's gone into a secular social club kind of thing? Exactly. They're, they're saying, oh, we have to accept all concepts of moral code uh, from all over the world and things of this nature. 
and they sound more like the liberal approach as part of the attempt to... Uh, well, so my impression is there's a big segment of the Jewish people, at least that are calling themselves Jewish in America today, that do not believe in God, certainly do not believe in Ten Commandments, and are kind of uh, like, well, well, let's accept, our, you know, uh, morality is relative. And I'm saying to myself, when this guy is telling me this, he took me over to this church or the synagogue, and I came back. And this guy is trying to teach me... Uh, all values are relative. And I'm saying, wait a minute. The last time I remembered, Yahweh was one heck of a jealous God. We, we talked go. about that yeah. a couple of weeks ago of the uh, Mithra. Isn't that what it was, Sam? And that's the big attack of, oh, hey, everything is relative. It's all cool. There's more than one way to God. And that's also part of the movement of the one world order of, hey, you know, let's all be friends and everything's going to be good. And, Part of what's keeping us apart is your insistence on this God thing. So, you know, you just need to chill with that. And that's been the uh, the rhetoric that is, and, and, and as you say, churches, uh, not only the Jewish people, I've seen it in mainline churches. Uh, there's a couple guys now, at the, you know, I've always been in with the Pentecostal church. The Pentecostal and the charismatic churches are way watered down. I mean, they just want to sing some nice songs and dance around and feel good and go home and okay and there's even churches now bringing uh, the uh, Quran into the thing and saying oh you know it's the same God Allah is oh, the same God yeah. and it's just it's scary no I, it's not the same I mean Allah to me would be Satan but uh, that's another argument so you know take too much time well I'm inclined to believe it was the same God because they did have a common ancestor. God but, God said to them, he said, you know, you call yourself sons of Abraham, but I can, God can raise sons of Abraham from these stones. That's not what counts. And, and it's that secular, my bloodline goes back to here. Well, God says, I don't care. My son's blood is what saves you. You know, and that, that, again, like you were saying, I, we are agreeing, actually. It's that relationship, and it's it's totally gone out of those others because they've taken it in. To a secular mind, it makes sense to just have these moral codes and they're kind of movable, uh, situational ethics, I think is what you were talking about before. You know, it kind of moves. Yeah, the situational thing. ethics, it's exactly. And but what I'm seeing is that there's been a lot of push, political push, from one of the Jewish churches called the Jewish Reform Church. And I believe that so many people who are claiming Jewish are part of this church and they have demonstrated, I think, politically as well as they are very much in support of this attitude of suppressing the freedom of worship in this country because they don't like the Jewish church and they don't like the Christian church, which has still got roots and connection to the original Jewish church. Yeah. They don't like like God's Ten Commandments. Yeah. It's well, hey, we got to take a little mini break. Um, before we take our break, I want to read a quote from Revelation chapter 3, verse 9. It says, Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which they there do and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. So, yeah, it talks about in the Bible where people say they are Jews and are not, and they're actually the synagogue of Satan. And I was thinking, well, maybe we could talk a little bit about that after the break. Take 
about uh, Damascus and Israel, but in the Bible, uh, it says that Damascus is going to be destroyed. Isaiah 17, I think about chapter, I mean, verse uh, 22 or something like that. Yeah, yeah, and I remember last fall when we were talking about uh, going to war with Syria, because Damascus is the capital of Syria, right? Yeah. And, uh, so we were talking about going to war with Syria because they supposedly launched chemical weapons against their own people or something like that. And the rumor was that if we went to war against Syria, then China and Russia would go to war with us. And so that was supposed to be like the beginning of the next World War Three. Interesting parallel there. Uh, Syria, through the Bible, was always the, uh, the punisher of Israel. Uh, God used them. Whenever Israel acted up, he did use them. Uh, we talked about the Holocaust. They were the ones that came in and brought, not the Holocaust, but the uh, Harbingers. Uh, and that fall, it was Syria that mm-hmm. he used to do that. But I was reading an article, and, and when I uh, said, who's the enemy of, of uh, Israel? Well, yeah, there's that internal I- enemy, which is the spirit of the Antichrist, secularism or humanism. But uh, all the countries there are an enemy. And uh, a lot of people now are saying that the next great war that really starts everything is more than likely. Now, these are prophets or, you know, acclaimed prophets. I'm not. I, I'm just kind of quoting the latest information that I've been hearing. Is Syria attacks and God moves in and flattens Syria would trigger the war of Gog and Magog, which is Russia, and more than likely including China, to realize that, whoa, they got some strength, and to trigger a, the, the big rebellion and attack by those guys against Israel. But uh, I know most of the prophetic pundits are saying that that will be the next big trigger war, is Syria making a move and Israel just jumping out and flattening them. And that just, you know, the logical consequence would just be have all the rest of their enemies just foaming at the mouth to get them. And really trigger things right. off. Yeah, what I was thinking, thought come to my head when I heard about the blood red moons was the time in the Bible where it talks about God comes down to rescue Israel. 
because Israel is being attacked by all these nations and God basically has to intervene. And then everybody on the planet, like I picture all these atheists who don't believe in God and, you know, like my brother who thinks that we're all the result of a bunch of chemicals bonking together in a primordial soup and stuff and we're just a big accident of uh, Mother Nature or something. I picture all these people... Uh, watching this event where God comes down and rescues Israel. And it says in the Bible that everybody will know that I am the Lord. Ezekiel 38, 38 22, and 39. 30, yeah. And I will plead against him with pestilence and with blood. I will rain upon him and upon his bands and upon the many people that are with him an overflowing rain and great hailstones, fire and brimstone. Thus I will magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations, and they shall know that I am the Lord. People who don't believe in God would understand that God did create all this, and it isn't just an accident. And it's just so annoying when you're dealing with people who are atheists, and uh, they say, well, there's no proof of God. I always say, well, go look at a flower or something, or, you know, go go to a, a... mountaintop and look up at the stars and I mean how can you look at all the miraculous things around us I mean from the teeniest little bug to the the flower and the way the the moon controls the tides and the moon and the sky is the perfect size to Mm -hmm. block the sun completely in a solar eclipse and way too much stuff that just couldn't possibly be the result of an accident you know well basically you're uh Reiterating what uh, is written in the first chapter of Romans. It said, you know, all of creation speaks of his glory, and therefore man is without excuse. And he, there's a little more detail than that, but that, that, that's what Paul was writing there. Of, no, man, look around you. <laughs> you. You know, if you've got your eyes open and you're thinking about it, you, you can't explain this away as just a big boom from nowhere. Of course, they didn't right. have that theory, but that's, that's what we do now. Hey, let me let me talk uh, just on what you said a little bit, because this is the way I would preach the sun and and the moon eclipse. The sun, obviously, S O N and S U N. The light comes from Jesus. He said, "I am the light." So the sun is the, the source of light. The moon would be believers. We reflect His light. We we live in His light. We live in His love, and and we reflect that. Now the earth is the earth. It's the world. So what happens? At, and one of the significance that the Hebrews put on it is when there's a solar eclipse, it's bad for the church or bad for the Jews. Well, what is a solar eclipse? It is when you or I as a believer or a Jew as a believer let the world get in between us and our relationship, as we were saying earlier with John, our relationship with the Lord. We're blotted out and we're turned to blood. We're no longer light. We're no longer salt and light as we're supposed to be. And the opposite mm-hmm. is, is when we, and this is what John was talking about, I think, and maybe you'll agree with this, John, is when we uh, we as the church get uh, carnal and get in between the light and the rest of the world, they can't see the light. They the light's put out because of our actions. Does that make any sense to you? I think uh, God is the light. Yeah. Christ, I believe, even says so, uh, that he is the light. So uh, I can certainly understand the connection in uh, the actions of the stars is that uh, a solar eclipse uh, is a situation where something gets blotted out and that's the sense of darkness in us. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's that's the way I, you know, again, uh, when I was standing out in the middle of the street, I was trying to show that to people, and, and I could see it, you know, a physical explanation like that of, of it getting through a little bit. But, you know, that, that's our job is just to try and get that point across about, you know, God is real, and we need to be in that light. Otherwise... We're going to be in that darkness, and it will not be pleasant. There is a heaven and there is a hell, and you don't want the second one. No. Yeah. 
Uh, here, I'm going to let Jim talk for a little bit. Jim wants to say something. Very good, Jim. Hello. Um, yeah, I, I just wanted to say, because I know a lot of people who are atheists. I've, I've been around atheists my whole life, and especially when I was a kid. My stepfather, he was a big-time atheist, and that kind of affected me for quite a while when I was younger. But uh, I have some other people in my family who are, are also atheists, but what really sparked my curiosity as to what what was going on, why I'm here, why we're here, what's going on, what's the purpose of this life and everything. I mean, we have all the tools nowadays. We can look up on the computer and watch people who have had near-death experiences and, and uh, you know, just do the research yourself, you know. And, I mean, just learning about the Illuminati and everything. I mean, if there's a... If there's a dark force, there has to be a light force also, you know. I mean, it, it, there's yes and no. There's black and white, you know. I mean, it, it makes sense. So, I mean, I think it's very important for people who do know the truth to, to explain it to those who don't know who, or who aren't sure, you know. I mean, because I've learned so much, and I've I've pretty much done my own research, which is, Cool. I don't think that. I don't think that I could have done it by myself. I think God kind of gave me a kick in the butt to do it or something, you know. But um, I'm glad that I have. Well, thanks, Jim. That was Jim's two cents on why he believes there's God because there's the devil. Yeah, I always kind of thought that was a pretty good argument for God. Ironically, that I mean, you have so many powerful people that believe in the devil. You go to like the Bohemian Grove and you got a bunch bunch of the most powerful people in the world, the leaders of all the nations, you know, presidents and kings and princes and the owners of the biggest corporations, the multi-bazillionaires on the planet, all worshiping a, a burning owl and praising Satan. It's like, okay, well, they're getting power from the dark side, so, and that's working for them on this planet and this world. Of course, it's not going to work for them too well in the afterlife. But um, I think we're out of time for this week. God is love, God is life, God is everything Strength and joy, hope and peace found in Him God, You are love, You are life, You are everything Please make Your precious home in me God is love God is life, God is everything Strength and joy, hope and peace found in Him God, You are love, You are life, You are everything Please make Your precious home in me When I am weak you are strong. You are strong. You're the tree. tree. Life comes from. You're the owner of my soul. Now my heart's an open door. Forever be the Lord of my life. God is love. God is life. God is everything. Strength and joy, hope and peace found in Him. God, You are love, You are life, You are everything. Please make Your precious home in me. When I am weak, I am weak. You are strong. You are strong. You're the tree. Life comes from You're the owner of my soul Now my heart's an open door Forever be the Lord of my life God is love God is love God is life God is everything Strength and joy Hope and peace You are love, you are life, you are everything. Please make your precious home in me. 
Your precious home 